Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get this uh, event started. We're uh, happy to have you all here on behalf of the Mackinac Center. Uh, my name is Michael Van Beek. I'm the Director of Research at the Mackinac Center, and uh, we're very pleased uh, that you're joining us this afternoon. I hope you're enjoying your lunches. Uh, we're also uh, live streaming and recording this event, so if you uh, want to share it later with a friend um, or view it again, uh, you can do that at our website at mackinaw.org. And this is uh, one of our Issues and Ideas Forum. This one is titled, Making It Easier to Work, What Michigan Should Do on Occupational Licensing. And I know that term gets everyone fired up. Occupational licensing gives me goose, goosebumps. But it really is a very uh, important issue uh, for uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Michigan workers. Uh, nearly a quarter of uh, people who work in the state need to have uh, some sort of occupational license uh, in order to work legally. Uh, and of course, as you know, we have lots of issues related to worker shortages, and it's becoming more and more difficult to find people to do the jobs that need to be done. Uh, so this is a really important topic uh, for, uh, for today. And uh, with us, we have three excellent panelists. Uh, but before I introduce them, I want to uh, just give you a quick uh, overview of how this is going to work. Uh, each panelist will present uh, for a few minutes, and then um, after they are done, we'll have time for Q&A. And the way we'll do the question and answer, uh, because we're recording this online, we need to make sure the questions are asked here from the podium. So we have uh, uh, little uh, cards for you to fill out. If you have a question, just write it on the card, and then uh, one of the staff members from the Mackinac Center will come and, and pick it up from you. And then uh, I'll read your question here from the podium to our panelists. So uh, starting first will be Jamie Cavanaugh. Jamie is an attorney with the Institute for Justice a national public interest law firm. Uh, they represented the Mackinac Center about 20 years ago, a long time ago. Uh, her practice focuses on economic liberty and private property. In 2020, she authored a report, Conning the Competition. She also works to end the overuse of fines and fees that can trap people, especially the poor, in the criminal justice system. Jamie grew up in Metro Detroit and studied linguistics in German at the University of Michigan and earned her JD from the University of Colorado. After Jamie will be Jarrett Skorup. He is the Senior Director of Marketing and Communications at the Mackinac Center. He's authored the reports, This Isn't Working, How Michigan's Licensing Laws Hurt Workers and Consumers, and another report entitled, How to Analyze Occupational Licensing Laws, a Model Review Process. Jarrett earned degrees from Grove City College and has worked at the Mackinac Center for over a decade. And lastly will be Ann Davis, who is a psychotherapist with over 20 years of experience. She has degrees from Central Michigan University and Colorado Christian University, and has a diverse background in the fashion industry, working with chambers of commerce, and in ministry work with young adults. Her counseling career has included work with the homeless population, group homes for the mentally ill, and private practice work with those from all walks of life. She recently moved from Colorado back to her home state of Michigan, and she now works for a counseling center in Midland, along with her husband, who is also a counselor. They are caring for an adult son with disabilities, a daughter, a puppy, and, and 10 chickens. Uh, so uh, maybe we'll hear more about how that's all going for Anne uh, at the end of her presentation. But uh, help, help me welcome our panelists, and we'll get started with Jamie. Thanks, Mike. Um, so again, my name is Jamie Cavanaugh. I'm here on behalf of the Institute for Justice. Um, just briefly, the Institute for Justice is a nonprofit public interest law firm. Um, although our main goal is litig litigating public interest um, impact lawsuits, we also do some legislative work around the country, and we focus on um, pr creating strategic research reports so that we can educate legislators and courts um, on the issues that we uh, work in. And so I'm going to give you some information from some of our strategic research reports today. Um, so I want to talk about three national problems with licensure today, um, with occupational licensing. Um, so our first problem with licensing, and licensing, of course, is just um, where a worker has to get a permission slip from the government to do the job he or she wants to do. So the first problem is that licensure is growing explosively. Um, in the 1950s, about uh, one in 20 workers needed an occupational license to go to work. 
Today, that number is about one in four, so about 25% of people in the United States need a permission slip from the government just to do their job. Um, and one reason that licensure is expanding so much um, is because licensure has become divorced from its purpose instead of focusing on jobs that um, impact public health and safety. Um, now we're starting to license jobs that are completely safe, things like interior designers and florists and tour guides, um, things that don't have any impact on public health and safety. Um, and another reason that licensure is growing so quickly is because most licenses are created and advocated for by people in the industry. Um, it's not normally legislators or the public thinking of seeing a problem and saying we need a license to fix this problem. It's actually people who are working in an occupation and saying, going to the legislature and advocating and lobbying and saying we need to be licensed. And the reason for that is because they realize that licensure creates basically a monopoly for them um, by bottlenecking who can become, uh, who can work in that profession. Um, they, you know, limit competition. They can increase prices. Consumers pay more for their service. Um, and that creates a lot of problems. And that leads me to my second point about licensure which is that licensure costs um, consumers and the economy billions of dollars. So I just mentioned that once an uh, occupation is licensed, um, the cost for that service increases. And we think it increases about between 20 and 30% on the whole. Um, but th those aren't the only costs that licensure creates. Um, there's also the costs for the workers associated with getting a license. So in one of IJ's strategic research reports, um, License to Work, we compared 102 low-income occupations across every state, and we found that on average, um, it takes about a year of either training or um, experience to get a license in these 102 specific trades and occupations, and it costs um, about $260 in fees to earn these types of licenses. So that's time and expense to earn the license and then fees that you're paying to the state um, as well as taking an exam in all those instances. Um, so there's a lot of sunk costs there. Um, and there's a lot of people who um, give up without even trying and that's not necessarily because they couldn't pass the exam but sometimes people can't take a year off working just to earn a license. So we're missing out on all the labor costs there, um, and we're ending up with people who are underemployed then because they aren't um, doing going to work in a trade that um, they're capable of working in. So you know, other costs we have to the economy are lost jobs, loss of mobility for workers because once you're licensed in a state, you often don't want to move to another state because you might have to go through the licensure process again. Your license often isn't transferable between states. Um, and then there's the loss in economic output. And so IJ estimates that licensure costs the economy upwards of 1.8 million jobs and $6.2 or $6 billion in lost economic output annually. So we're not talking about small numbers. These are big numbers and big losses. And then the third point I wanted to make is that licensing doesn't improve the quality of services. And IJ put out a brand new report this fall um, that says, um, that, that proves this point, that licensure doesn't improve quality. But what we did was compare states, neighboring states, where one state licenses a certain occupation and the other state doesn't. And we looked at Yelp reviews for businesses right on the border um, between the two states. And we found uh, no, no difference in the quality of services. We looked at um, specific, uh, the specific occupations of manicurists, um, tree trimmers, um, and uh, interior designers. And then we also compared a couple, um, we compared barbers and cosmetologists where one state would have a high licensing requirement, maybe 1,500 hours, 
and then one state would have a low, lower licensing requirement, maybe 1,000 hours. So we didn't find any difference in quality um, except in one instance with tree trimmers in, uh, what is it, Virginia, I think? And yeah, in Virginia and Maryland, Virginia doesn't require a license for tree trimmers, and Maryland does, and actually quality was higher in Virginia where no license is required. So, you know, that finding suggests that maybe the competition is a good thing, and when we're letting everyone go out and become a tree trimmer, um, there's more competition and more reason for people to um, offer higher quality services. So those are some of the, the national um, trends and issues with licensure, and I'm gonna pass it off to Jarrett now to talk about some Michigan-specific licensing issues. All right, is my uh, PowerPoint, can I, here, let me see. You might need to uh, pull up the other one, Mike. On the... It's being worked on. Oh, okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk about um, licensing and it being specific to uh, here in Michigan and kind of what, what we've done. So <clears throat> one, of the, one of the points on licensing is, you know, and of course, if I, my parents have a tough time telling people what I do for a job. <laughs> so they're like, I don't wanna say you work in politics. We'd lose a bunch of friends. I don't wanna, I don't know what you mean by you do occupational licensing research. Um, so they just say he's happy and he's, he's got some grandkids for us. So um, I did, my reports look at licensing specifically here in Michigan and uh, what the effects are. So Jamie gave a great overview. This is how we define occupational licensing. She said government permission to work. So almost always this means government mandating paying fees every year uh, that you have to have a certain education um, you might have to have certain classes within that, certain training hours, and then passing exams. That's generally how it works in Michigan. We, we license about 175 occupations in the state. And some of those are very restrictive, uh, medical doctors. Um, but those are pretty, medical doctors and a lot of health are pretty similar, state to state. And then we, we also have a lot of uh, ones, not necessarily lower income, but more working class occupations. Um, and I, and you, we compare those. My dad uh, does construction, carpentry, so he, I grew up in Illinois, Michigan licenses a lot of those occupations that I worked in with my father that we were not licensed in in the state of Illinois. So it was always a fascinating thing to me to see how that worked in practice. Um, as Jamie talked about, so in Michigan, you know, about 1% of workers earn the minimum wage, about 13% belong to labor unions, uh, 20 to 25% um, fall under occupational license. So it is the biggest area that affects most people in the labor market. Um, and we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of studies on the issue. Um, our past three presidents have have their labor departments have taken an interest in this. Biden administration, uh, the Trump administration, the Obama administration, all generally along you know a lot of agreement. Like all this is overly restrictive, especially in certain areas. Um, and they try to figure out different ways they want states to analyze this. It is an interesting thing because this is the regulations are almost all at the state level. Very little. Uh, federal licensing. Um, there's some requirements in some areas, but it's almost all coming from the states. So Jamie talked about, well, why do we have licensing laws? Um, and it is, you know, on the one hand, there are associations. She talked about they want licensing laws for different reasons. Uh, uh, but consumers believe licensing laws protect them. Um, you can see this in survey data. You can see this when you, when you talk to people. So I have presented on this a lot. I've talked with a lot of people about the issue and they say, well, we need licensing laws to protect us. That is why they go in. Um, if you go in, if you're a state lawmaker, I assure you, I promise you, the association will come in and say, we need licensing for protecting public health and safety. Okay, so some of you probably think that. They're like, yes, obviously these are, we're very careful. We have these laws for a specific reason. So the way I found around this is, okay, and when I talk to lawmakers, I know we have Rep. Dave Martin here, um, I say, here's the questions I have for the associations. If, we're cons if licensing laws are about health and safety, let's see how you guys do. You know, we're bringing you back to high school. We're going to have a little quiz for you. So let's see um, how you do on how Mission licenses its occupations. All right, so what are you more concerned about? Are we more concerned about the brakes on our car 
or are we more concerned about this old pole barn you have and you need to get that repainted, um, that you need to repair it? Who's more concerned about the barn? No one? Okay, breaking your car. Okay, well, state of Michigan, how about the pilot of the airplane you're on? Or the barber cutting your hair? Okay, more concerned about the pilot. Well, the state of Michigan, there's no mandatory education for an auto mechanic. There's private licensing, a lot of them go to. Um, we, re we required, I should say required, I like this update. So this was a rare license the state got rid of. Um, but we required 60 hours of training, 900 hours in fees to, to paint a barn. And you had to be over 18 years old. If you hired a teenager to paint your house or paint your bar at any point in the last 40 years, you broke the law, unless they had a license. And I don't know if any of you checked. Pilots, so that's 1,500 hours of flight time. This was only 250 hours of flight time until 2013. Um, 1,800 hours to be a barber here in the state of Michigan. 1,500 to be a, be a cosmetologist. 1,500 to shampoo hair in the state of Michigan. Um, you know, I would suggest we don't really spend a lot of careful time thinking about targeting these regulations in the right way. And that's a really major difference. I mean, think about how much money you're making as a cosmetologist or a barber compared to an airline pilot. But you make them go through thousands. Yes, you're right. All right, I'm putting some of these up. This is a quiz. Let's see how we do. And I just say, lawmakers, you need to pass this. If you're telling me licensing makes this huge safety difference. All right, carpentry or drywall? Which is licensed in the state of Michigan? I'm going to say drywall. You can sh shout up. And carpentry is licensed, ah. not drywall. All right, we're getting there. How about asphalt versus concrete? Asphalt driveway or concrete driveway? Well, concrete is licensed. No asphalt. Thanks. Uh, you know, so we can get a little bit more road work done. Sewer and septic work versus excavation work. Excavation requires a license, not the sewer and septic. Oh, sorry. Um, the, so the red one is the one that is licensed. So excavation requires the license, not the sewer and septic. Insulation versus plaster. Pretty sim These have a theme. They're similar type type of work. Insulation requires a license. Plaster, you're good. You're good to go. Um, masonry versus paving. Uh, so pavers are kind of the stones you put up together in a house. Masonry. Tile and marble versus carpet. Tile mar marble. Vinyl flooring versus wood flooring. It's tough. So wood floors need the license. So they'll ask you, wait, what, what type of floors do you need? I need to know who I can send. Fence. Uh, somebody got at me on this. They were very confused. I realized they did fencing, like with swords in their free time. So they were like, I don't think I have a license for that. Um, so putting up a fence versus siding uh, in a house. So the society needs a license. So whether you're with the swords or putting up a fence, you don't need the license. <laughs> Awnings versus roofing. This was a big deal for me. I did roofs with my dad, had to know. The roofing needs it versus the awnings on a home. Last one, house wrecking versus house moving. Taking down a house or moving a house. Yeah, so the house wrecking needs it. So a lot of arbitrary licensing and also a lot with what, so you know, here's the list of those. Side by side. I mean, this is from the state licensing department. Like, they'll put this up because people had a lot of questions. What are we allowed to do? What are we not allowed to do? Um, and it's not just, and you know, I push back, it's not about do we totally delicense something or do we license something? That we don't want to get into that. Like, there are some things that need to be regulated and some things that don't need to be regulated, but it's the question over how do we regulate something. In Illinois, when I would build decks, and I build decks in Michigan, if you build decks, you have a requirement at the local level that it's inspected. That's really the important regulation. Me sitting down and doing 60 hours at a computer, that will not teach me how to do a deck. But the state requires that, and then I have to go pass a test. Doing an apprenticeship, learning how to build, and the inspection is really how we should regulate something like that. So this is on a house. Uh, the green does not require a license. The red does require a license. But it's not just, it's also how much is something, what does the state require? This is the mandatory hours the state of Michigan requires to do these jobs. You want to open a restaurant? Nope. No mandatory hours. Do you want to be a chef? 
no man to our house. That's doing food preparation, something a lot of people get worried about. We don't require, the state doesn't require you to go to Le Cordon Bleu or, or go through something. We say you can figure out what kind of restaurants you want. We'll regulate it through the health department in a different way. Um, private pilot, 40 hours, 40 hours of flight time, and then you can fly people around in a plane. You can start that at 14 years old uh, versus hanging gutters, and an EMT is 200 hours. Consider an athletic trainer. An athletic trainer, so many more. What's that, 20 times the hours um, to be an athletic trainer versus an EMT? I don't think we spend a lot of time thinking about this. So we talked about these, the shortage issue, shortages of teachers and doctors and builders and mechanics and therapists. So Michigan reciprocates licensing really pretty easily with about 32 occupations. If you're a barber in Indiana, you move to Michigan, um, you know, it's a fairly easy process to go for. Um, you can, it's a little bit more restrictive for some other things. Some things it's really difficult. Uh, we've made, we've certainly made it easier for teachers, but there are other states that do it much more easily than us. But physical therapists, auto mechanics, siding, state of Michigan says, nope, you got to go through and go through. It doesn't matter if you've been working in that for 20 years in Ohio. Um, you know, I don't know what's happening. You know, maybe the siding is way worse in Ohio. They get really worried. Nope, we got to go through the own, your own rules when you come up here to Michigan. There are states that do it differently. Ohio passed a broad-based reciprocity law. Arizona, automatically. If you, if you have a license in another state and you move to Arizona, boom, you're working. You don't even need the license if you've been working, because you have some states where Arizona licenses and others don't, or vice versa. Um, I think if you've been working in something for a certain amount of years and you haven't had any problems, let's have you come into Michigan and work in it. Um, I was talking to Rep Martin, my sister, she married a guy in the Army. She's a teacher every time she moves. Pennsylvania, going to Tennessee, going to Washington State, going to Kansas. Now she's in Kentucky. She's got to think about what does she need to do. She's been teaching and doing the same thing for years. Why is she not allowed to just move in to a district that wants to hire her and be allowed to work? And I, I think that's what we should do here in Michigan. So there's five main things I think we should do. Did I get it to four? Okay, five. So we have done a couple of them. Uh, one is... We do not allow local governments to do licensing anymore. Previously, we did for a long time. Uh, we changed this in 2017. So Detroit had uh, 60 occupations. It required its own licenses. You could be a license and work as a plumber in Oakland County, but if you went into Detroit, they said, nope, you got to go do your own standards. You had that for a variety of licenses. Uh, Bay City requires you to have a license if you want to be a uh, fortune teller. Um, you, know, you have a lot of these things like that for some reason. The state said, okay, you know, you can't, you can't add new licenses going forward. Um, a big important thing, less talked about in this, is people with criminal backgrounds. So it's not just requiring the license and not just a background check. But the state would actually, if you had a felony record, they would not allow you to get licensed in most fields. If you had a misdemeanor, very often you would not be allowed to get licensed. They would look at that and hold it against you. I understand that we want to know what people's backgrounds are before we hire them, but... The legislation we did, which is something I've been working on um, for a while, is essentially, I think you should, if the person's uh, criminal background is something unrelated to what they want to work in, if somebody has a drug charge and they did their time, I think they should be allowed to be a roofer. I think, that, you know, a person hiring them can still know that and they can understand that background check. If you're a nurse, we, it was previously nurses, if you had a felony record, you could not go work in the medical field. And we have changed that through legislation. But if a hospital does a background check, they know what your crime is and says, we want to take a chance on them, I think they should be allowed to do that. And I'm thankful we do allow that now. Um, but then there's other areas we have not done. So the universal recognition. I think Michigan, if people want to come in here and work and they've been working in that field and they've done it safely, we should allow them to do it. We did pass some legislation. Uh, Rep. Martin um, has cared about that issue on military veterans and their family or active military. Um, I think we should expand that to, to everybody. Um, we should review every license. That's the key. It's not about let's review it so we get rid of licenses, but let's make sure those hours actually make sense or that you can do something through an apprenticeship rather than actually sitting in a classroom or doing something online. And then after that review process, let's set it up to get rid of things that do not make sense. So I'm happy to take any questions at the end, and uh, I'll let Ann talk about her story. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I sure appreciate you paying attention to this issue. 
Um, it means so much to me that I took work off and came down here from Midland just to share with you what it was like for me to move into the state of Michigan and transfer my license. Um, I'm a native of Michigan, born and raised in Midland, and it wasn't a very welcome homecoming. <laughs> my, my father um, was a chemist, my mom a teacher, my three brothers and I all were active in sports and um, music and youth groups, and we worked hard, and we spent summers camping at Lake Michigan, and this is just a magnificent, beautiful state. Um, we graduated from Midland High School and went to different colleges in, in Michigan. I went to CMU, my mom's alma mater, and my grandfather had been the dean of education there. I'm a real Michigander. <laughs> um, so um, then I worked in the fashion industry, as, as um, Mike mentioned, in Chamber of Commerce, College Ministry in Ann Arbor, and one summer in Europe. And then I decided to take a huge step and go to grad school in Colorado for a master's in counseling. Um, helping people on a deeper level is rewarding, fulfilling, and even fun for me. Everybody has their unique gifts. <laughs> so many people tell me, oh, I could never do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, while in Colorado, I met and married my husband of 27 years, and he also became a counselor. And then we had two children and um, worked as counselors, as, as Mike mentioned, with all people from all walks of life. My husband was the director of um, Denver Rescue Mission for Homeless, doubled that program, and um, sunk a lot of hours in with um, group home kids. And I worked in these areas a little bit too. Um, we had a private practice for 20 years. And um, when our kids graduated from high school, my aunt in Bayport, up in the Thumb, passed away suddenly. That was like January 2020. And so realizing that my mom is older than her sister, um, and with restrictions for travel and gatherings, we decided that we needed to move closer to my mom. And so a summer of 2020, we packed up and moved back to Michigan. Um, the focus of today's topic has to do with licensing as being reciprocal. An LPC, licensed professional counselor um, level, as my husband is, is uh, reciprocal. It took a two-month delay to transfer his license. Um, but uh, I worked part-time. And so I was a registered psychotherapist, an NLC in Colorado, which worked well for being a part-time counselor with a private practice. So I didn't need to make any changes at that time. Um, but I had taken all the professional licensing classes, so I had the full education and training. One of our children, as Mike mentioned, has special needs and requires so much care that I cannot work full-time, but the requirements to get the LPC in Colorado meant you had to work two years full-time. So I, I didn't need to. Um, BPL, the Bureau of Professional Licensing here in Michigan, was not prepared to even evaluate my education and transfer my license when I applied. I lost 13 months of income waiting and jumping through hoops to prove my master's degree was current and complete. And in the end, they said it was adequate. There was no reason to delay my work as a counselor here in Michigan. Um, it took repeatedly calling and pressuring and to get action. I'm really good at like getting in there, being a, you know, and I'm telling you, it was like swimming through syrup or something. It didn't work and it just kept taking longer and longer. Um, then finally, when I knew I'd met all the criteria, I was hired by a counseling center, but I couldn't start working until they finalized my license. Um, so I had to call multiple times to get that done. So anyway, right now there's a three to six month waiting list for people to get counseling because of the heightened level of stress in our society today. And I was delayed a year where I wasn't able to help anybody. Um, they told me that there was an emergency waiver so I could practice without being approved. Um, but that risked them deciding that um, I didn't meet the requirements. And, and then facing repercussions. So I just wasn't gonna take that risk. Um, 
because I have an NLC, here it's LLPC. It's completely different. So maybe you have a question. Maybe. Okay. So what would you tell this just on um, me and my family? It was horrendous. It really was very upsetting. I just went and got counseling. <laughs> um, thankfully, my husband's a therapist. <laughs> um, it felt oppressive and it drained our bank accounts. And I'm sure a lot of people go into debt, if not bankrupt. Um, how are we to repay student loans? That's only gonna last forever. Um, a short time. Repaying loans, we don't have to right now, but that is something that has to happen. And you can't even work. So I felt the same with my office. Okay, I'm sorry, this is in view. Um, in their view on their system. Oftentimes they were pleasant and they were just, you know, totally hyper-focused and self-assured that they were doing what was necessary to complete the applications. But I called multiple advocates, including the Mackinac Center, because my application I paid for wasn't even being processed. Finally, a way to complete the application during their indefinite delay was set up. <laughs> Didn't help me speed up anything. But anyway, um, this should not be allowed. My husband had to delay uh, of about two months, and that was too long for a reciprocal license. Um, the state can never repay the suffering of people who didn't get counseling or of people who can't work. Um, and um, I'm told they won't repay my financial losses, which was tens of thousands of dollars. Um, people's right to get help that they need and to work using their training, which they spent tremendous hours of time, ener energy, and money earning, must be put above licensing process that is ineffective and unnecessary the way they're doing it. So LPCs are reciprocal and other licenses in many occupations should be reciprocal also. So I guess I'm the poster child today. <laughs> but thank you for listening and influencing change. Great, thank you, uh, all three of you. And uh, if you have a question on a card, uh, just kind of hold it up and one of my colleagues will come and, and grab it from you. Uh, I've got a couple up here already uh, for uh, any any of you, any of the panelists. Um, are there licensing requirements for uh, police officers in many states? Uh, and um, if there's if they're not, are there any conversations about about licensing police officers, or do you know about what what are the requirements are for becoming a police officer? There is licensing for police officers in most states. Um, it's, I think it's fairly similar. So in Michigan, it's, um, you can do it through the community college or uh, go through the academy. It's about 600 hours uh, of training. Uh, whether that's too much or too little, I, I leave to you. Um, what about uh, one question here is about the concern of um, weaponizing licensing. Uh, so, for instance, with the um, uh, COVID lockdowns that happened um, in 2020, uh, many states, and Michigan is one of them, that, uh, you know, people who operated their businesses um, illegally uh, outside of the uh, bounds of a lockdown order uh, had their licenses suspended or, um, or even worse. Um, is there concern about, uh, about that issue um, in, in the U.S. and in Michigan in particular? It's a great question. Um, yeah, so during Michigan, during the emergency orders, one of the questions was, you know, and we'll, we'll avoid that topic for today, but over how stringent the governor's orders were and what parts of the law she was able to put things in place. But a backup that you had is the licensing department, which falls under whoever the governor is, they have a lot of authority on things like what are the continuing education requirements, interpreting the law and the rules, the legislature has given them a certain amount of power. And so one of the things the governor did was made it, uh, you closed down barber shops and cosmetology shops. And so there was a protest right out there on the lawn of barbers and cosmetologists and a variety of other folks. So they cut hairs, they cut hair on the lawn. And the there was kind of this question over 
well, does the governor want to really like have the state police round them up? What do we do? And so the licensing department went after the licenses of some of those people, saying, which they have the authority to do. Um, and it was actually, uh, so they're cited for violating the licensing code, which does make it, you can't cut hair outside of a licensed industry. And so it was like separate from the emergency orders, but that was a way to go after people um, going, going after their license versus trying to pursue things through this other emergency law. Some of the early people that were in trouble during the lockdowns often were licensed industries. Um, actually, the earliest cases tended to be roofers. Um, there were contractors and people that would work, and they would work illegally, um, frankly. Um, but roofers would get caught because people would see them out on the roof. They'd report them to the department. The licensing department would go in. Um, and they would cite them for viola violating lockdown rules, but also for violating other licensing laws. So it is something, whether you're Republican or Democrat, or agree that if they really do want to go after uh, people, that's something the department just has a lot of authority to do um, if they want to. Uh, so kind of related to that, um, there, there could be a concern, too, where certain, um, uh, certain ideas uh, are... Uh, required to be, uh, you know, mandated as part of the license. So there's a question here about like, is uh, are there certain uh, like critical race theory? Is that a, a required? Do people have to go and learn about that in order to be, get a license in any fields, or or sim or kind of similar issues related to that about mandating a certain type of um, education uh, in order to get licensed? I haven't seen that specifically um, anywhere in the country. Um, but I will give an example. So right now I'm representing um, a group of lactation consultants in Georgia. So Georgia created a brand new license for lactation consultants, women who give other women advice on how to breastfeed. Um, and so in Georgia, um, the license that was created was advocated for um, one group that certifies lactation consultants, but there's many different types of private training someone could do to become a lactation care provider. Um, but of course, one group out of all these many types of certification went and lobbied the legislature and said, we need a license, even though no one's ever been harmed by any lactation provider, you know, we need a license and make us the only certifying body, the only way that someone could become licensed. So if this law takes effect, there will be hundreds of women, at least 800 women in Georgia who will lose their license. Um, and, and if everyone has to now take this new training, to become a lactation consultant, um, they will have to do a bunch of arbitrary requirements. So some of the requirements through this certifying body are to take college level courses and things like anthropology and public speaking and you know classes that aren't going to relate to lactation consulting. Um, they have to take one college level credit of biology and you might, you know, someone can try and make the argument that sure that's related to lactation consulting, but really what are you going to learn about um, that would be related to lactation consultancy in a one college level credit biology course. I don't even know how you find a course that's only one credit in a topic as broad as biology. So, um, you know, I haven't heard of these examples that the question asked about, but you do see lots of examples of um, training that isn't related to, um, to the topic, I guess, that, that um, the license is, is about. So in Michigan, uh, Governor Whitmer with the um, licensing department, they, they have authority, the legislature has given them authority to set the continuing education requirements and the hours. And one thing is w we do see, which is a concerning thing, is uh, disparate impact in health outcomes among different racial groups. And so one of the things she did was said for people in the medical professional, doctors and nurses, you need to do two extra hours of continuing education in that area of disparate impacts. I have gotten emails about it, notes about it. I don't know if those, you know, some of them are, these are bogus, they're not helping us. Some are people, you know, very defensive, saying this is essentially accusing me that I'm not treating people the same way based on their race. Um, I think mine is more of an issue of, I just don't think one person should be the one determining the amount of continuing education hours and what those specific areas are, because it's just gonna get weaponized politically as we go forward. So that was more of my issue on it. So we uh, went from kind of general to more specific here. I'm wondering, um, there's a question related 
uh, about uh, are there are there certain issues related to licensing that can be that can be uh, fixed or improved from a, a very general level that all licensing requirements would be bene would benefit from, or is this the type of thing that really has to be done on a one one by one basis, very individual look at each license and um, and get reform done that way. Jarrett mentioned um, recognition is one, um, you know, overarching thing that can be done that can help a lot of people. Um, another thing that states can do is to pass sunrise or sunset laws. Um, I know Mackinac has worked on that and is continuing to work on that, but that is, those are laws that require um, a state agency to review existing licenses every certain number of years to see if they're related to the public health, if they're um, improving public health and safety, um, and to either adjust the requirements for that license or to get rid of it altogether if, if there isn't a means end fit there between the licensing requirements and any public health and safety benefit. When uh, Governor Snyder came to office, he ordered a review of a lot of the licensing laws in Michigan, and I thought that was really helpful. It, it did cause the legislature to look at a lot of these. I think the easiest thing you can do for everything is that type of review process, where a lawmaker just knows, here's an occupation, how are we, what is our hours, what is our mandates compared to other states? Because that's very easy. If you look at something, the, the one we got rid of most recently was painters. Only nine states required a license for painters no one else in the Midwest required it. It was pretty easy for lawmakers to say, oh, I, don't, I can't really think of what the health issue is with painters. Um, and obviously people have disputes with contractors all the time, but let's let that get sorted out in the marketplace. Um, and so I think just having, at least having that, very regularly giving to lawmakers, here's the number of, here's the occupation that are licensed, here's how many states do it, here's how many hours they do. And if we're really out of whack, it's an easy one to go after and, and, and dig deeper into on an individual level. So I was admitted as a um, counselor as if I just graduated from college, from my graduate degree. And I'd had 20 years of counseling. I did it part time, you can say 10 years, still. <laughs> That's long enough to be licensed. I had um, supervision hours that you know were there. I didn't have to use them, but I had 3,000 um, supervision hours. So if their board would get together and say, okay, let's look at this transfer. What does this look like? Okay, here's what you need to do to finish. Instead of, you know, I mean, they love me where I'm hired because they don't have to do anything. I've already been, <laughs> you know, I've already, they don't have to train me. Um, and of course, we're always lear learning. But the other point that I wanted to make, so I think it should be specialized when need be. Um, but uh, the other thing was that, um, my mind went blank. Um, anyway, it's okay. Uh, well, thank you. Here, I'll ask. Uh, I'll ask one of my own while I'm uh, reading this next one that just came in. Um, I I remember that I think IJ um, put together a study once that uh, sort of outlined several different uh, alternative methods of quality control that were not licensing. Uh, I wonder if Jamie or, or Jared, if you could talk about about those, because that's kind of uh, uh, kind of in the background and all around this is that there's other means to regulate behavior and work behavior uh, other than requiring people to get a license. And that's just what I was going to say. Okay, is well, you don't there make, you go. <laughs> you don't stay a counselor if you're a bad counselor. You know, you don't stay a good psycho psychotherapist. You get a bad reputation. People won't go to you. Yep. I mean, you won't succeed. Yeah. Exactly. So IJ has something called the inverted pyramid where, um, so if you think of a pyramid or just an upside down triangle, at the very bottom, we have licensure, which is the most restrictive method of um, regulating a occupation. And the steps above it are um, less restrictive ways to regulate. And so, of course, um, market forces, such as um, things like Yelp reviews, um, most small businesses or businesses in general care more about um, a bad Yelp review than whether or not they have a piece of paper from the government, you know, hanging on the wall, whether they have a license, a license from the government. 
Um, but there's lots of other steps such as just simple registration with the Secretary of State or um, license or bonding and insurance requirements that can offer um, some protection to consumers without the um, heavy you know, cost of licensure. One of the slides I had up there was uh, people who open a restaurant don't require any license or being a cook in a restaurant. And, and you know, people, uh, the way we license food is through the health department and they're subject to inspections. And um, one of the things I just try to challenge people is like there's an assumption that licensing means some type of elevated level of safety when there's a lot of things that people care about much more than that. And I think that's a good example. Everybody here knows the difference between a McDonald's and a five-star restaurant, even though they are regulated from the state perspective and from the county's perspective, exactly the same. They still differ in the food and what your interpretation of them, and that's how it would work in a lot of these other areas, even though it is food, something you're putting in your body, and we do have people with food poisoning and a problem. And I think the biggest challenge uh, to get to people is that you are always going to have issues, regardless of whether you have licensing for something or not. One of the stories a couple of years ago, there were two um, funeral homes in Detroit that it was a horror show. I mean, they they had, uh, you know, they had not they were storing bodies in the basement. Um, a lot of like what were infants. They'd been there for years. Just this every every horrible thing you could Im imagine. Uh, they lied to people about you know what was happening with their loved ones and with the cremation and all this stuff. They were licensed. They'd been licensed for 20 years. They'd been, one had been for 20 years, for 30 years. It didn't prevent something like that happening. You're going to have bad actors in different areas, um, and that's going to continue, whether you have the license or you don't have a license. The question is, does the, license, does the regulation actually cut down on that? And so we need to focus the regulation on what we care about. And actually, by adding licensing, we get away from that because then we get the department chasing people all over on a variety of things rather than staying really focused. And everybody, uh, a lot of people that work in the industry, if you have a business, knows about somebody that's a bad actor and the state never investigates, never investigates, never investigates because they're so focused on all these other things rather than being hyper-focused on what they should be. One other thing I'll add is that when you over-license uh, an occupation, sometimes you then have the problem of people, people going to the underground economy um, where people are doing it off the books without a license. One area we see that all the time um, and an area that IJ is really passionate about is with um, hair braiding. So um, states, there are some states still that um, require African hair braiders to get a full-blown cosmetology license. So that's anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 hours of cosmetology school, and you don't learn, not a single hour is devoted to African-style hair braiding during that training. Um, and so, you know, of course, these women aren't paying ten to $20,000 to go to school where they won't learn African hair braiding. They already know how to do it. Um, so instead of opening their own businesses and opening salons, and they, you know, do this out of their homes, but they're forced to, you know, charge lower prices and not be able to have the same business opportunities that everyone else has uh, because of these licensing requirements. I can't let that go without also mentioning people. So our our cosmetology and barber licenses are, are barbers were some of the earliest licensed areas because they tended to, like, that was like 200 years ago, that was like your doctor also. It was like, yeah, oh, he's the barber, he's the doctor. Um, but it was an early license. It's been licensed in Michigan for over 100 years in, in a lot of states. But the licenses are really strict. A lot of licenses are, you only go through this if you make money from it. And there might be an income cutoff. And that's to allow, you know, if somebody is doing drywall, but also has to change one outlet so they don't have to have full licensing in, in each. We don't have that exception in barbers and cosmetology. And what that means in practice in the state law is it is illegal to do any barber or cosmetology services uh, if you do not go through the full licensing in the state, except for yourself or a direct family member. And they define, like, what is cosmetology services? What it literally means is if you have a teenage girl that's braiding another teenage girl's hair, unless she's gone over through the cosmetology services, she's breaking the law. And, you know, that was a – nobody's enforcing that, of course, but that is the law in Michigan is that you are breaking the law if you cut someone's hair that is not a direct family member. Uh, for the for the most part, uh, I we've – given uh, kind of medical licensing and uh, health-related licensing, uh, maybe a bit of a free pass 
Uh, I'm wondering if that's um, uh, if that's earned, and if there are there differences. Do we know, do we know of some licenses like uh, medical issues that where yeah they really do make a difference for the quality, and you know states that require more strict licensing for doctors or nurses have better health outcomes. Who thinks medical licensing is really important? State of Michigan puts up your medical doctor. It's, on, it's online, you can go see. Um, it's something like one out of every eight doctors has been sanctioned to some extent. Um, you know, I think that's national, but it probably applies for Michigan. Who's pulled up their doctor's licensing report? It's online, it's free. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, I think medical license is the most important thing if you're gonna think about a restriction, but I also find like that, nobody has ever actually done that. Uh, you, you could be going to a doctor um, that has had issues with the license and you would have no idea. So how do you find your doctor? Well, reputation, reviews online, my sister uses them, she likes them, uh, my brother-in-law likes her, she's a great doctor. That tends to be how we find these. And in, we do have a case study, the United States is the most restrictive for medical licensing. The, the hoops you have to go through, it's very clear there's a lot of things we could cut back on and still maintain health and safety. In the European Union, your licensing transfers across these 22 countries. And, and you have medical doctors in some countries, it's equivalent of a bachelor's degree, and they can move in and work in other ones. And we actually do have studies on that and how happy patients are and things, and things along those means that I, I think that we are overly restrictive. And then the specifics of what you have to think about is every time, like Jamie said, it, when you add a license, you cut down on the number of people that can practice. And so in Michigan, where we really restrict what our nurses are able to do compared to other states, limiting on number of prescriptions, they have to operate under the direct care or supervision of a doctor, where in other states they can open their own medical practice and do a lot of more basic things for, for different people. Well, when you allow that, you allow more care. And if you're in the Upper Peninsula and it's 100 miles to the closest medical doctor, your option is a medical doctor or no one. Whereas if we loosen this up, it could be maybe I go to a medical doctor for this, or there's a couple of nurses in town or nurse practitioners or somebody along those lines. So we, again, it's one of those things where we, when you do loosen those requirements, we have seen in other states, you get more medical care for a certain amount of people and certain segment of people. So Jared, you mentioned that um, this has been an issue that uh, the Obama administration was interested in, the Trump administration, now the Biden administration. Um, are we making progress? Are, are you optimistic, uh, Jamie, about the, the future? Uh, what, uh, Anne, maybe you could uh, weigh in with your personal opinion about this based on what you've gone through uh, in your own life. Uh, so are we, is it rosy skies or, uh, or are we uh, treading uphill still? Colorado's not a perfect state, but every, everything was easier there to function. It was set up, streamlined, clear yeah it was but it's very expensive it's, it's more expensive here and more difficult here yeah. yeah there's a lot of variability by states um for instance idaho the governor in idaho had um uh had all of the administrative regulations around licensing repealed and told all the boards um, if you want to license still then you go back and you know re-enact re-promulgate your rules and regulations. Um, so there are a lot of people taking interest in this topic and um, taking, taking positive steps, but um, you know, licensing is still increasing right now. We're not seeing it, we're not seeing it contract right now, I would say. You know, my example about the new license for lactation consultants in Georgia, um, that I think that the trend is still to increase licensing right now, not to decrease licensing, unfortunately. I'm optimistic in Michigan. Um, we've had about 10 years now where we, we actually have gotten rid of some licenses, um, which is very rare um, to do just at all. And then we've also just made it easier. We've done things like say, okay, you can do all these classes online. I mean, that is a big deal. When we had, if you wanted to be a barber, you had four schools to go to. Uh, the most northern one was Flint. So if you were a barber in Gaylord, you know, you had to drive three hours to go to, if you want to be a barber. 
And so at least allowing a lot of those to be, you know, not all of it for Barber, but for a lot of other areas, you can do them online. That makes it easier for people to access um, the legislature. Again, Rep. Martin, um, they've been working on this. They, they opened up like we're cosmetologists. They can do many of their hours through an apprenticeship. I mean, that was a big deal. Like that saves you so much money if you can go do it through an apprenticeship. You can often make money while doing your training. We allow that for electricians. We allow that for plumbers. Why weren't we allowing that for barbers? and for cosmetologists, some of these other areas. So making that a lot easier to fulfill your hours, so that's good. Um, and I think there is, like I said, getting rid of the local licensing, making it easier for people with criminal backgrounds. There's certainly a lot more awareness, um, and it's been bipartisan. That's a good thing too. It's, it's for, maybe for different reasons, but it's generally been bipartisan to strike down some of these rules. All right, join me in thanking our excellent panelists today. Well, this concludes our, our program for today. Uh, we want to thank you again for attending and remind you that a uh, recording of this will be available on the Mackinac Center's website. Also, on your way out, uh, we have some publications uh, on display over there, and those are uh, free for you to take uh, if you'd like and uh, read through them, learn more about interesting public policy issues or share with your friends and family. Um, those are, those are uh, free to use. And then uh, a reminder as well that our next event is on November 3. Uh, it's not here in Lansing. It's actually at Northwood University in Midland. Uh, and it's the Mackinac Center's uh, first president who's going to be presenting, uh, Larry Reed. And uh, the title of the presentation is uh, Lessons from the Robber Barons, Monopolies and Markets. So it should be an interesting uh, presentation, one many of you might be interested in. So we hope to see you there. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>